The BBC is back in the news. No, not for a new documentary, but for an income tax raid. BBC offices have been raided by the Indian Income Tax Department. The raids were conducted in Delhi and Mumbai. The authorities are not calling them raids. They say these are just surveys. What for? To investigate tax evasion, a team of 15 officials searched the offices in Delhi and Mumbai. They were looking for documents related to the BBC's business operations in India. There are allegations of irregularities. This relates to international taxation and transfer pricing. Reports say the mobile phones of employees were seized. Those in office were told to return home. Those at home were told not to come to office. The reports triggered a storm on social media. Remember, this action comes days after the BBC broadcast a documentary. It relates to the 2002 Gujarat riots and implicates Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who was then the Chief Minister of Gujarat. The documentary came in for a lot of criticism. The Prime Minister of the UK said he did not agree with the characterization of Modi. The US government dismissed it and India blocked it. Today's IT survey comes in the wake of this row and opposition parties are criticizing it. They say the government is being vindictive, which is not surprising. This is what the opposition is meant to do. Would have been news had they supported the government's move. But here's something the opposition leaders may not bring up. The BBC has had a troubled history with India. It was launched as a mouthpiece of colonial Britain. And long after the British left, the broadcaster perpetuated their biases. The BBC has been repeatedly expelled from India. And every time it has been expelled, the Congress was in power. In 1970, they broadcast two documentaries, Calcutta and Phantom India, both by a French filmmaker. Both led to outrage among the Indian diaspora in Britain and the Indian government. They showed India in a bad light. The then Congress government banned the documentaries and expelled the BBC from India for two years. Then in 1975, when Indira Gandhi imposed the emergency, the BBC was expelled again. A statement signed by 41 Congress MPs accused the BBC of broadcasting, quote-unquote, notoriously anti-India stories. They asked the government, and I'm quoting again, to not allow the BBC to report again from Indian soil. This time there is no expulsion, not yet at least. The broadcaster is being investigated for tax evasion. The story is still developing. And while we called out the BBC's hypocrisy and bias on the documentary, we are in no position to comment on the raids until the investigation is concluded. Advantage, we support media freedom. But we also believe that no broadcaster is above the law. The media should not be targeted for speaking truth to power. But the media cannot use that as an excuse to break tax rules or any rules for that matter. So all those frothing at the mouth on social media, we say wait for the full story to emerge and read some history in the meantime. As for the BBC, this is the last thing they needed. The broadcaster is losing both funds and credibility at an alarming rate. The latest scandal involves its chairman, Richard Sharp. He's been accused of making, quote unquote, significant errors of judgment. He's charged with helping former Prime Minister Boris Johnson get a loan. In return, he's said to have secured the post of the BBC chair. Classic quid pro quo. Sharp denies it. Either way, it dents the reputation of an already battered BBC. Let me show you the findings of the British media regulator Ofcom. It says, BBC journalists lack basic understanding of subjects and present data, and I'm quoting again, in the most alarming ways possible. A previous report on impartiality said audiences, quote unquote, consistently rate the BBC less favorably. Complaints against the BBC have gone up by three times in the last few years, so playing victim in India may not help very much. They can accuse the Indian government of victimizing them, but how will they explain the backlash they face in their home country? Tax evasion or not, the BBC must realize it can no longer operate as a relic of the Raj and get away with doing hit jobs in India. In Europe, another government says it faces a threat from Russia. We're talking about Moldova. Their president has warned of a Russian plot, a plot to topple her government and install a puppet regime. Quick primer. Moldova is a former Soviet state. It borders Ukraine. Along with Ukraine, it hopes to join the EU. It has taken a lot of Ukrainian refugees and doesn't support Putin's war. Now Moldova says Russia wants to install a government that supports the Kremlin. On what basis is the president making these charges? On the basis of intelligence sent by Kiev, Ukrainian President Zelensky spoke about this in Europe last week. Needless to say, Russia has denied it. It says Moldova is going the Ukraine way, drumming up Russophobia to align with the West. Our next report decodes the latest crisis in Europe. 
Moldova's president, Maya Sandu, has warned of a Russian plot, a plot to destabilize the country and install a pro-Moscow regime. She described the details based on the intelligence shared by Ukraine. The plan for the next period involves actions involving saboteurs with military training, people dressed in civilian clothes who would undertake violent actions, attack government buildings and take hostages. By organizing violent actions, disguises protests of the so-called opposition, a change of power in Moldova is being pursued. What she described is right out of Russia's playbook. Russia was accused of using similar tactics in Ukraine in 2014. The breakaway regions of Donetsk and Luhansk saw protests, violence, and then pro-Russia officials were installed. Now, Moldova fears the same. What could be the reasons behind this plot? Sandu says Russia has two motives. The purpose of these actions is to overthrow the constitutional order, change the legitimate government in Moldova to an illegal one, which would put our country at the service of Russia, in order to stop the process of European integration, but also so that Moldova can be used by Russia in its war against Ukraine. What's the basis of these charges? Intel from Ukraine. Is there any other proof? U.S. officials were asked about this on Monday. This is what the White House's national security spokesperson had to say. I know of no independent confirmation, but we're certainly not uh, questioning the capacity, the will uh, of, the, uh, of the Russians and Mr. Putin uh, to try to do that. It's perfectly right up, page right out of his playbook. But why would Russia be targeting Moldova? The answer lies in its geography and history. Moldova neighbors Ukraine. Its location could make it a staging ground for Russia's forces. Russia could use it the way it uses Belarus, that's another neighbor of Ukraine, and it's pro-Russia. With Moldova in its fold, Russia could potentially attack from another direction. Moldova already has a pro-Moscow breakaway territory, Transnistria. The region houses some 1,500 Russian troops who serve as peacekeepers. With a puppet regime in Moldova, this area too could be put to use. And why would Russia oppose Moldova's European integration? That's where history and geopolitics come in. You see, like Ukraine, Moldova was a former Soviet Republic. The region was part of the Russian Empire from 1812. But it has also broken away from Russia at various times in its history. Moldova has been unified with Romania more than once. But it was regularly brought back into the Russian fold. It became an independent nation in 1991 with the fall of the USSR. But as soon as it achieved independence, the Transnistria conflict began. Russia helped secure a ceasefire and has had a toehold in the region since. Moscow has always wanted to maintain its presence in the former Soviet sphere of influence. So any move that brings Moldova closer to Europe goes against Russia's plans. Which brings us to present day. Like Ukraine's Zelensky, Moldova's Sandu is pro-Europe. This is how Russia's foreign minister described her recently. Moldova is being looked at for this role of the next Ukraine. First of all, because they were able to put, by quite specific, far from free democratic methods, a president as the head of the country, who is simply striving to join NATO. She has Romanian citizenship, she is ready to unite with Romania, and is generally ready for almost anything. Reunification with Romania would greatly help Moldova, which is among the poorest European nations. But if this happens, Russia would permanently lose a former Soviet state to the EU. Even if reunification doesn't happen, Moldova's EU candidacy was confirmed last year. Under the current government, it seems Moldova will definitely move towards the West. So it makes sense for Russia to want a regime change. That doesn't mean Russia is pushing for it. Russia has denied the charges and lashed out at Moldova. The process of transformation of Moldova, a sovereign country with its own traditions, goals and objectives, into another Ukraine is not just ongoing, but is gaining momentum. Moldova has been facing turmoil since the war in Ukraine began. Its prime minister resigned last week. It faces regular protests over the cost of living crisis. 
Now, President Sandu has found the perfect excuse. She's blaming Russia for the instability. But will it be enough to pacify Moldovan citizens who have to deal with all the chaos? Russia's rivals have more reasons to worry. Putin's invisible hand could be at work again. A new private army might be taking shape. An army inside an energy company. You heard that right. We're talking about Gazprom, one of the largest gas producers in the world. It is owned by the Russian state. And it could be raising a private army. Some reports have emerged. The Russian prime minister has signed some orders. It allows Gazprom to form a private security company, a subsidiary of sorts for Gazprom. What will this company do? And why does a gas company need its own army? The order does not spell out the details, but some theories are doing the rounds. One purpose could be to protect its pipelines. Gazprom is one of the largest gas extractors in the world. In 2021, it was the largest producer of natural gas. It owns about 178,000 kilometers of gas pipelines. 178,000 kilometers. They're spread out around the world. Gazprom is critical to Russia's economy. It is the main source of Russia's revenue. In 2019, it accounted for 5% of Russia's GDP, so the Russians could be securing their facilities. But there's one more theory. Gazprom could be building a security organization, one that could strengthen Russia's military power. And the idea is not far-fetched. State-owned enterprises often serve as an extension of the Russian state. Gazprom has a long history of this. Just look at the recent events. When Russia invaded Ukraine, the West punished the Russian economy. They slapped tough sanctions. In response, Moscow slashed gas supplies to Europe. Eight months after the war began, Russia cut 80% of gas supplies to the EU. Western Europe's gas stocks took a big hit. In 2021, it got 40% of its gas from Russia. By the end of 2022, that supply dropped to just 7.5%. Gazprom was the main supplier to Europe. It owns and operates the Nord Stream pipelines. They supply gas to Europe. And now it is slowly turning off the taps. This is economic warfare. Gazprom might take it to the ne next level. Ukraine has taken notice of these developments. Kiev says Gazprom could be following the example of the Wagner Group. What's the Wagner Group? A private Russian paramilitary unit believed to be deeply tied to the Kremlin. Reports say the Wagner Group is involved in the Ukraine war. It has tens of thousands of fighters on the battlefield. Many fighters were recruited from Russian jails. Wagner has mercenaries deployed in West Asia and Africa too. I'm talking about countries like Syria, Yemen, Libya, the Sudan, Mozambique, Madagascar, Central African Republic and Mali. What are Russian mercenaries doing in all these countries? They focus on two kinds of missions. One is protecting the elite or the ruling class. And second is protecting critical infrastructure. And this is no longer a secret. In fact, Russia promotes these mercenaries. The Russian foreign minister was recently in the Sudan. Sergei Lavrov spoke to the press. He highlighted the role of private militaries there. We have commented several times on the activities of our private military companies which work at the direct request of the countries concerned, like in Central African Republic. This is a contribution to the normalization of the region as a whole, where terrorist gangs continue to be active. Lavrov has been dropping hints. Recently, he said, it is important to protect Russian assets. That comment was made in Iraq. Was that a reference to Gazprom's new unit? Well, we shall find out soon enough. And finally, vantage shots. We couldn't have wrapped up without bringing this up. It's Valentine's Day today. Couples the world over celebrate love. Commerce booms. This day has become more about marketing than love. Look at the ads being shot at you. Even headphones are being sold as a symbol of love. But in India, Valentine's Day is also political. We have a love-hate relationship with the concept and what it's doing to our culture. So much so that it could have been celebrated as Cow Hug Day. That proposal was withdrawn doesn't change our love for cows. But in the age of Tinder and Bumble, the idea was a bit extreme. The rethink, we say, was well advised. Meanwhile, in Thailand, couples tied the knot while riding an elephant. In the UK, a woodland heart tribute by a man for his late wife. And if you're looking for a one in a million Valentine's Day gift and have about $14 million to spare, part of Croatia's unique heart-shaped islet is up for sale. Also in the spirit of love, but not for the weak-hearted. A Japanese artist celebrated or created freaky, flesh-like accessories. They range from mouth-shaped purses to dice with blinking eyes. 
They are a sight to behold. We're leaving you with these images. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow. なんかもう愛着が湧いてきましたよね。